Okay, today we're going to do a uh, lesson on the countercurrent multiplier system which occurs within the kidneys. Actually, it occurs within a very, very microscopic portion of the kidney called the nephron. The nephron is what I've drawn up here on the board. We have about a million of these nephrons in both the left kidney as well as the right. So per kidney, about a million of them. And each nephron is made up of this sort of baseball catches mitt which is referred to as a Bowman's capsule. It's called a Bowman's capsule. Then there's a large convoluted area of the nephron, which is referred to as the proximal convoluted tubule. And then from there, it sort of does this hairpin loop down, which we refer to as the loop of Henle. And then again, it goes through another set of convolutions, which we refer to as the distal convoluted tubule, before it attaches itself to a duct called the collecting duct. The collecting duct eventually goes to the renal pelvis, which then eventually goes out to the uh, ureter and the urinary bladder. So it eventually is the waste products that get go out of our system. Within the Bowman's capsule, though, we have this highly um, uh, tightened ball of capillaries that we refer to as the glomerulus. The glomerulus is a ball of capillaries that are tightly intertwined around each other, sort of like the same thing as, uh, as a ball of yarn. We have this arterial that leads into the glomerulus called the afferent arterial, and then we have another one that leads out of the glomerulus, which is referred to as the efferent arterial. These arterioles, of course, carry blood into this uh, ball of capillaries called the glomerulus. Now the afferent arterial has a larger diameter than the afferent. So a large amount of blood enters into the glomerulus and because of this highly pressurized uh, ball of capillaries, it causes an enormous amount of filtration. The filtration of the products that are within the blood eventually seep into the Bowman's capsule. And that could be like, for example, water. It could be uh, some proteins uh, like amino acids. It could also be some glucose may end up coming out. And then also you have, of course, nitrogenous waste, the nitrogenous waste products, in which the <clears throat> nephron is trying to get rid of. This whole um, amount of, of fluid then, then goes down the proximal convoluted tubule and eventually reaches this loop of Henle. When it reaches the loop of Henle, what happens is surrounding the whole system is this uh, system of capillaries, which we refer to as the peritubular capillaries. They're called the peritubular capillaries. And the peritubular capillaries um, will take whatever that is within this nephron back into the blood. Because not all of the materials that end up going into the nephron are bad materials. Like for example, some amino acids and glucose and even water. Those are substances that the body does not want to get rid of. And so you want to get those back into the blood. Because if you don't, eventually it'll then uh, go right out towards the collecting duct, out to the um, urinary, uh, to the ureters, and to the urinary bladder, and then out the uh, urethra, which you don't want to do that for all these products. So some of this stuff gets re-picked back up by these peritubular capillaries back into the blood. Like, for example, you'll have some amino acids, also, some glucose, uh, even some water will get re-picked up. Until finally, by the time in which it makes this turn down into the loop of Henley, the substances that pretty much are found within the uh, filtrate is urine and also water. Okay, and so the urine, of course, is made up of this nitrogenous waste products that eventually go down the loop of Henley. Now, it's important to note that the descending loop of the loop of Henle, those walls are permeable to water. Whereas the ascending loop of the loop of Henle are impermeable to water. That's an important concept known only within the, the, the loop of Henle. Furthermore, outside of the loop of Henle, you have sort of this salt gradient. 
And the salt gradient is made up of this uh, outside salt um, concentration that is very small at first. It might be only, like for example, 200 milliosmoles at the top, but then eventually it goes down to 400 milliosmoles and then 800, and then by the time in which you get at the bottom of the loop of Henle, it's about 1,200 milliosmoles, which means that you form this high hypertonic environment that is found outside of the loop of Henle. Because the salt concentration increases as you go down and is greater on the outside than inside the loop of Henle, you end up having the water come out of the filtrate here. And again, gets picked up by the peritubular capillaries, which is very important. So that by the time in which it makes the turn at the loop of Henle, there is a concentrated urine that actually is occurring. The urine becomes much more concentrated as it makes this loop and makes this turn. As the filtrate then goes back up the loop of Henle here, the walls are impermeable to water. So just as there was an increase of salt uh, concentration on the outside as you went down, there is a decrease as you go back up. But because the walls are impermeable to water, the water can't come back in because uh, the walls won't let them. And so therefore, the urine remains concentrated, and then eventually it goes through the DCT until finally it turns down into the collecting duct. Now, what's interesting about the collecting duct is that the walls are normally impermeable to water. So we have the walls are impermeable to water in the collecting duct. So normally, the water, uh, the filtrate, will then just go straight through the collecting duct to the renal pelvis, out the ureters, to the urinary bladder, and then eventually out into the urethra. In other words, that's the, the, the products, the, the waste products, the fluids that we end up taking out of our system. But in times of dehydration, that changes. What happens is there is an endocrine gland that is at the base of the brain called the pituitary gland. And the posterior portion of that secretes a very important hormone called ADH. ADH is antidiuretic hormone. And what antidiuretic hormone does is it causes the collecting duct walls to become permeable to water. So that then as the filtrate goes down, again, which is subject to this salt gradient here, what happens is even more water ends up coming out, gets picked up by the blood, and the water gets put back into the blood and does not go out of the uh, kidneys. And that's exactly what you want. You want to be able to maintain and retain that water within the system as much as you possibly can so you don't lose it, uh, particularly in, in the times of dehydration. And so that's why in times of dehydration, what happens is when we urinate, the urine is very, very uh, strong and very odorous. Uh, it also has a very strong yellow, uh, deep color to it, and oftentimes we don't um, urinate a lot. Uh, on the opposite hand, when we're not dehydrated, the opposite occurs. It doesn't have a very strong odor. We usually excrete volume, a large amount of volume of it, and the color isn't as, uh, as, as strong yellow. And so that's pretty much how this works. So we refer to this as the countercurrent multiplier system. It's called countercurrent because at any point within the system, the, the filtrate is moving at opposite, uh, at opposite uh, times or opposite, it's moving at different places and different points. And at the same time, it multiplies the, uh, the, the conservation effect. In other words, it concentrates the urine at different points, at the loop of Henley, and then also at the collecting duct. So there are two places where this uh, nephron can actually conserve water, and so we refer to this as sort of a multiplicative effect of being able to conserve uh, as much water. These nephrons are extremely important to maintain the, not only the water balance, but also the electrolyte balance within our uh, urinary system. Okay.